I'm Devin Stewart from Carnegie Council in New York City. I'm sitting here with Ian Bremer, founder of Eurasia Group. And today we're talking about top risks for 2016. We're talking about what those risks are and what they mean in terms of ethics for individuals, companies, organizations, and governments. Ian, great to see you. You too, Devin. So what do you mean by a top risk? What is that? And how do you determine what a top risk is for 2016? A risk is something that can lead to outcomes that are negative outcomes that uh, are otherwise unexpected. Um, not, not where, I mean, a U.S.-led globalized world with democracy and human rights and uh, free markets would otherwise expect you to get to. And, you know, the way we rank these, the way we assess them, is along three dimensions. The, the first is uh, what's the likelihood that the risk actually happens? Second is how imminent is it? Is it like could happen tomorrow or maybe at the end of the year we might see some of it? And then the third, of course, is the magnitude of the impact that risk would have, not just on the country itself, but more broadly in the global scheme of things. How, how significant is this? You put those three things together, you shake them up, and uh, at the end of the day, you, that's, that's how you kind of rank order it. That's a, that's a quantitative assessment? Or you know, I would say there are certainly lots of quantitative elements when you think about scale. Um, but ultimately, you know, we've got a firm of almost 150 people. We have 500 folks in 90 countries locally. We spend about three months from start to finish actually putting this together. We've done it for about 16 years now. Um, it's, you know, there's a lot of inputs. And when you're talking about political risk, uh, there is a lot of art in addition to science. That doesn't mean there isn't expertise. There's enormous amounts of expertise. Um, but it's not as if a computer is going to replicate this. Um, and I think one of the ways that we try to give a lot of rigor to the process is we tell all of these experts, we're going to take this piece and we're going to keep it on our homepage for the entire year in addition to all of the work that you know, the publicity it gets around the world and the rest. And so that at any point, anyone that comes and looks at our site is going to actually go back and see what we actually said until the next piece comes out on January whatever, the first Monday of the year in 2017. And I think uh, that, that tends to hone the mind a little bit. You know, mm -hmm. Political science has been one of these fields that people for such a long time have basically said, well, you know, how do you get anything right if you can't possibly get it wrong and you're, you're hedging all over the place? No, no, you can get this stuff wrong. For 16 years, we've been, you've been doing those, these top risks. And for eight of those 16, we've had the pleasure of having yeah. you here at Carnegie Council to look at the, the ethical implications and the dimensions of those risks. It's a, a chance to sort of get outside of the news cycle and the hard news and look at the bigger picture. Yeah. Uh, I, I would say that of, of those eight years, um, looking at your and uh, reading it on you know close to New Year's Day every every year, this might have been one of the most alarming of all the years that I've seen. And it must have been difficult to to go through that process to come to such a dramatic conclusion. Uh, for example, you talk about the possibility of uh, a war in the Middle East, con conflagration. Uh, you also talk about um, uh, uh, the lack of, of the United States as a global fireman. Uh, how much worse do you think the Middle East could actually get? I mean, what, let me put it this way. What is the big picture, and how, what's your worst case scenario? Look, I mean, we wrote this before Saudi Iran happened, right? Um, and, uh, you know, nothing like showing up on Monday morning and saying, hey, you know, t tick off that risk, okay, check it for the year. Not fun. 2016, in my view, facing the world's most powerful ever terrorist organization, facing the greatest refugee crisis that the world has yet experienced, and with six failed states across the broader Middle East, um, those things are not coincidental. And it absolutely makes me feel, it makes us at Eurasia Group feel, that this is very likely to be the most dangerous 
year of geopolitical risk that we've experienced since we started this process. So you're absolutely right to say that there's a lot to be concerned about. It's not that there's no good news. There's actually a lot of good news. Um, but it ain't in the Middle East. Um, and um, the, the very fact that uh, the Saudi versus Iran conflict, the Americans are on the sidelines. Um, the Saudis decided to execute this cleric and then further escalated after their embassy and consul was attacked by breaking off diplomatic relations and then commercial relations and air flights and lobbied heavily all of their allies to do as much as possible. Some listened, many did not, to also pressure the Iranians. That was done in literally weeks before the U.S. intends to implement the Iranian nuclear agreement, which is by far the signal achievement of the Obama administration in the Middle East in seven years. Now, the Saudis aren't stupid, right? So they knew that what they were going to do was going to be immensely problematic for the U.S., and they also knew that the United States would absolutely not be coming out loud and proud on their side. America's supposed to be their big ally, which means they didn't care. And, and it also meant that they're under an enormous amount of pressure. So when you ask me how bad it can get, I mean, I yeah. think... Without talking about Armageddon, but are we seeing a Sarajevo moment, right, for the Middle East? We might be. Um, I do not know what legitimizes the Saudi regime going forward. And I think one of the reasons why they have decided to pick a big fight with Iran is because they don't know what legitimizes the Saudi regime going forward. And, you know, ginning up a common enemy in a big way could at least help. Because it ain't the royal family, and it's not the economy, and it's not the geopolitical support they're getting in the region or globally. Everything that could be going wrong for these guys is going wrong. And the reason I'm spending so much time focusing right now on Saudi is because if you want to fix the Syria war, you have to have a willingness of the Americans and the Europeans to really get involved. Maybe some compromise with the Russians. But the most proximate players on the ground, the Saudis and the Iranians, have to at least be able to talk to each other. We're very far from that. If you want to be able to fight ISIS, same thing. You want to deal with Yemen, same thing. You said you want to take the big picture here. Let's take the big picture. You have a bunch of countries that basically were created because they found themselves randomly, fantastically, in a desolate region with massive wealth that was right underneath, right underneath their feet. And by tapping that wealth, they didn't have to do anything. They could build all the trappings of a state and institutions and largesse and it worked for decades with billions and billions and billions of dollars. Now, if you look in historic context, there's no reason why that ever should have succeeded. It was this random stroke of luck. But there's certainly no reason to believe that it can persist. And it won't. And it's not just that the US is not the policeman and doesn't want to be. It's not just that no one else will take the American's place. It's that the price of energy has dropped through the floor because of technology. Well, what, what makes Saudi Arabia work with almost 30 million people when the one thing that legitimizes their government is no longer worth anything to them? I, I don't know how that works. And so these, the, in, when I say that I think there's the possibility of a Sarajevo moment, I'm not sure if we've just hit it or if it's coming. But what I do know is this region is unsustainable. These states are unsustainable. These rulers are unsustainable. And when you're giving me you know, tens of millions of young men who are 
agitated and they have the technology to organize and to make that disenfranchisement known, uh, this is not going to end well. Uh, so that's where we are. Well, that's, that's a good segue to, let's, let, let's look at your top five risks. Sure. Let's, let's take a look at those. And since uh, number five is Saudi Arabia, as you said, um, let's look at the ethical dimensions of each of those five mm. risks. Does the United States have an actual positive role to play in this unsustainable region? And um, should we even be taking sides? It seems that um, right now is, is, a, is a moment where countries are, are, are vying for support of the United States, either moral support or, or material support. Uh, is there a way to do good in the, in the Middle East? Uh, what should the United States do? There are certainly ways to do good for the Middle East and for the people of the Middle East. Um, and um, as you know, 2016 is an election year. We are talking a great deal about foreign policy in this country. We're talking a great deal about security in this country. We are not talking very much about what we should be doing for all of the people that are displaced. So one way the Americans can and do do good in the region um, is we are providing by far the largest amount of humanitarian aid in the region, uh, both to the countries and also for displaced peoples. And I think that's very important. We're helping to build infrastructure. We're helping to improve health care. Are we doing enough? Um, you can't look at what's happening in the region to these people and say anyone is doing enough, obviously. But we're doing vastly more than anyone else. And that should make us proud. And we shouldn't lose sight of that. The Japanese are number two. And the Americans, at least, we've got some proximate responsibility. You know, we blew up the Iraqi institutions. We kind of broke it. And Colin Powell did say that meant that we had some responsibility to fix it, right? Crate and barrel always work that way. It's not clear why the barrel of your gun doesn't, right? So when I think about that, the Japanese didn't break a damn thing, right? And, uh, and the, but, you know, they're just generally nice people. So, I mean, they're, so they're spending a lot of cash. And then after that, it tails off pretty dramatically. Now, you and I have spoken in the past, and uh, we spoke here last year about how disgusted I was that we lived in a country that had the Statue of Liberty, and yet we were doing nothing to respond to the refugee crisis. Well, in the last 12 months, it's gotten much worse. There's no political willingness to make a difference. 25,000 people, Hillary Clinton talking about. I mean, the, the Germans are taking a million, and the Germans are looking to the US, and their most important ally in the world, and they recognize that they're getting nothing. And this is damaging for Chancellor Merkel, the most important leader that Europe has had for a decade, and the Americans are nowhere. They're absent from the process. And, and, and obviously, the ethical dimension of that is huge. Now, more broadly, the question of what should we be doing on the ground in the region um, that's a complicated one. The easiest way for me to answer that is to say that 95% of the conversation that we of a nation have been having about the rise of ISIS and the war in Syria has been about military solutions. And I do not believe that we can bomb or invade or surveil ISIS and Assad into submission, right? That's not the way you fix this problem. It's like when you look at the drug problem and the drug war in Mexico and you say, well, gosh, you know, we gotta tighten the border and gosh, we gotta go after these cartels. Actually, what you need to do is stop the demand for drugs. And unless you do that, the drugs are gonna find a way to get to the people because the money is there. Well, it's not that the money is there right now in the region. In fact, a lot of the money isn't there the way it used to be. But the demand is there. The demand for this radical jihad. Um, and we Americans need to spend a lot more time, a lot more time, 
talking and thinking about what are the ways that you can provide alternatives to the demand for ISIS. We are not doing that. Speaking of which, good segue to number four. So it's ISIS and friends. Do, do we as a country, the United States, have a special responsibility to take care of that problem, given we seemingly had a role in spurring and spawning such a, such a challenge to global security? Look, I understand why people would believe that we have a special role to play, and I understand why people would believe that we should leave this alone. Uh, and and I, I think that there are reasonable explanations ec ethically behind both. You know, you look at young people in America who have seen trillions of dollars wasted fruitlessly on wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. They believe that they're taxpayers and uh, they don't see the same opportunities for themselves that they thought that their forebears were having. Um, the ability for the middle class to rise up, um, to take their education and get meaningful long-term employment is eroding in this country. The Americans aren't spending money on infrastructure. The Americans you know, are, are leaving a lot of these people behind. And I think that if you look at the track record the Americans have had outside their country in the Middle East over the past decades, there are very good reasons for you to be skeptical and say that money would be much better spent sure. in the United States. That is, I think that is an ethically defensible argument. I also think there's an ethically defensible argument to be made that says that the way that we defeated the Soviet Union, which was a morally repugnant regime, um, which, um, was, um, which breached every human rights obligation in a social contract between its citizens and the government that could possibly justify investing in Soviet authorities the responsibility to arbiter force. Mm -hmm. um, we needed to defeat them, and we did. And the way we defeated them was not just by building a military. Ultimately, it was the power of ideas and values. It was the promotion of democracy and rule of law and an independent judiciary and, yes, a free marketplace that was aspirational for the captive nations of the Eastern Bloc. And we actively beamed that into these countries. We had our captive nations parades. We had Voice of America. We had Radio for Europe. And I think that there's a very strong argument to be made that if we hadn't done that, that the, the history books would be written very differently for the Europeans and for the world. And, and, there, and, and there's an ethically defensible argument to be made that the United States needs to be actively promoting its values among the governments of the Middle East that we have been providing a lot of support for. We've been selling them a lot of weapons, but we haven't expressed not a lot of concern that their systems, their systems of governance are in many ways repugnant to us and also to their own sustainable development and to their own citizens. So you've got two arguments. They are completely at odds with each other. And American allies around the world actually really have no idea which of those two we should actually choose. And certainly if you look at the 2016 presidential debate thus far, you would not receive any clarity in that outcome. Certainly liberal values was a major force in determining the end of the Cold War. Uh, and it happens that number three on your top risks is China's footprint worldwide. Uh, as China's influence grows, will it be um, setting new standards for the way countries are run, the way businesses are run, the way people see their freedoms? Um, uh, will it challenge a liberal, the liberal order? And if so, how? And does, it, does it even matter? Of course it matters. It matters because China's big. It matters because they're spending a lot of money. It also matters manage because they're volatile and unstable, as we've seen with the um, machinations of their own marketplace, the impact of a country that is that opaque and has that much state intervention
can whiplash international markets as well. So there's that. But the heart of the question is as China gets bigger, as its footprint gets larger, as it spends more, it has more influence, what does that do to a liberal internationalist order? And you know, here, uh, there's no question that um, what the West believes is correct, um, is not going to be supported in priorities and values by the way the Chinese are going to spend money. They want governments to align with them. Their commercial needs uh, buy from Chinese state-owned enterprises. When the Americans, of course, put money into the Marshall Plan, we said, well, you won't support liberal internationalism. That's not what the Chinese are doing. So it will undermine those things. Now, let's be clear. The Chinese actually have justifiable reasons to want to do that. Um, I mean, they are at a very different stage of development. And if they do not promote their state system, uh, profits are going to leave China and they're going to go into other countries because the power is held by the Western multinationals. So the Chinese use their legal system in the absence of rule of law, in the absence of independent judiciary, and the alignment of the Chinese companies with the Chinese government, in many cases the direct ownership, they use that and their market pull to be able to help themselves develop over the long term. Who's right, right? I mean, if I were advising the Chinese government, I certainly would be telling them to do much of what they're presently doing. And even for the Americans, I mean, if China were to suddenly become a liberal democracy, the instability that would come as a consequence of what would clearly be an illiberal democracy would be anathema um, to most people that I know uh, that are thinking about how the U.S. needs to actually co coordinate and organize itself globally. Um, so this is a place where um, values are going to be um, complicated and they're going to be fought heavily between the two countries. Moral contention is at the center of what we look at here at Carnegie Council. And, and um, if I could be kind of rude and, and lump your risk number two and risk number one together, uh, I think it actually is kind of appropriate, if, if, you, if you will, Ian, because both of them are in my opinion, kind of about, about um, values. Yeah. And it's about classical liberal values. You know, number two is, is we're looking at the risk of a closed Europe. And that, as you put it, um, that means what's in question is a Europe whole and free is facing an identity crisis. And I, I take that to mean an identity crisis over its core liberal values. And risk number one, you're looking at a hollow alliance um, where in the past, European-American uh, relations have been glued together by uh, explicit values of, of freedom and equality and human rights. It's even in our founding documents of, of Europe and the United and States. US, yeah. How do you see values standing up to these enormous challenges uh, at the, at, the, at the core of, of the sort of um, force of, of liberalism. Well, and, and this, is the, this is precisely why we wrote the report this way. You know, in, in a year where clearly, you know, China's whipsawing everybody and the Middle East is in flames, how could we start? with these two risks that have nothing to do with those things. And it's precisely because the values of the world order that we have grown accustomed to living in for three quarters of a century are now under a threat that is unprecedented over the course of that order. The weakness of European values and of the fabric that cohered what Europe actually means, much more concerning than the idea of a recession or a financial crisis. The fabric of the transatlantic relationship, which was the most important alliance and still has been for 75 years in the entire world, they are eroding in front of our eyes. And it's not that we don't like each other anymore. It's that that's just not where we're, it's not our priority. It's not what we're paying attention to. It's an apple sitting on a tree that you can just watch dry and wither and doesn't have the importance, the luster, the significance uh, that it has for all of these years. Where does that 
leave values? Where does that leave leadership? Where does that leave the world order? It, that is what underpins the most dangerous geopolitical environment that we've seen in decades. Um, and so I think this was a year that you couldn't just jump in with China or ISIS or Saudi Arabia or Putin or any of those things. You had to actually take a step back because it's precisely the erosion of these values, of these ethics, that we've taken for granted. We've taken for granted a liberal international order that we didn't realize that allowed us to live the way we have around the world. And we assumed that, well, no, those things are just, that's just the way it is. But those are actually very significant political assumptions that we have been allowed to live within over the course of our lifetimes, and we will no longer be able to. It is the end of a transatlantic global order, and it's going to be experienced in 2016 in ways that it has never been since its crucible, its formation. Well, Ian, that has been an incredible, thoughtful, uh, insightful conversation. Thank you. For more on this program and other Carnegie Ethics Studio productions, visit carnegiecouncil.org. There you can find video highlights, transcripts, audio recordings, and other multimedia resources on global ethics. This program is made possible by the Carnegie Ethics Studio and viewers like you.